Frequency response analysis, or FRA, is a method that process engineers will use to model how sign inputs will have an effect on outputs in your system. And uh, in this example or video, I will be going over the core concepts of amplitude ratio and phase angle and how we can calculate those um, given some kind of process transfer function. And so um, to do that, uh, to give a visual um, illustration of what amplitude ratio is, I'm going to uh, talk about some kind of thermal cycler. And if you've worked in a, a biochemistry lab, uh, you know, use them in PCR and stuff like that. We can also scale up to industrial reactors. And um, so what it essentially does is it will uh, vary the heat up and down um, on your solution. And if we were analyzing some kind of huge reactor, um, we can expect different results. And so um, if we look at like a graph of the temperature, and we'll have some kind of uh, axis that it will be oscillating about. If we look at the time, if we're in a time domain, um, this first curve I will be drawing is how um, our input is varying. So uh, this could be the temperature of the heater. And uh, so this will be temp. Uh, and so uh, if we had a very high amplitude ratio, what that means is that our input will track it very, I'm sorry, our output will track our input extremely well. And so if we had a really small reactor or, or a really small um, reaction test tube, um, this is the kind of uh, response we would expect. So we have a high amplitude ratio in this instance. Now, if we had a really small uh, heater and a massive reactor, uh, what we would find is that it would respond maybe a little bit to changes in your input, but not that much. And so um, if you can follow, uh, we would get very dampened response because the uh, heat really doesn't um, make too big of a difference in our system. And so in that case, we see uh, a low um, amplitude ratio. So essentially your output doesn't really care what your input's doing or it's, so um, it's equivalent to a, a high pass filter. I'm sorry, a, a low pass filter. So, or yes, it is a high pass filter. So um, with high pass filters, um, what we see is that, and they do occur quite a bit in nature, um, very high frequency changes will be uh, neglected. And so if we had a thermal cycle that was going like mad, um, oscillating about a, a point, the output won't really care. And so um, we're filtering out the higher frequencies. And we realize this in our frequency response analysis with low amplitude ratios. And so um, now that we've covered what AR is, um, to go into phase angles, uh, if our system had some kind of delay, uh, such as if we, if it had a lot of uh, mass to heat up and cool down, um, but it did have, we did have an adequate heater, this phase angle uh, fee will be how much there is of an offset um, to our input. And so uh, the graphs uh, can get a little bit messy, but if this is our input, um, what we can get is some kind of, uh, output that would track it with an offset uh, like this. And so this will have some kind of uh, non-zero phase angle that we must be able to account for. And uh, later on, we will also see the emergence of resonant frequencies that do get quite interesting. And so um, how we actually calculate the amplitude ratio and phase angle is pretty straightforward. And so uh, in this example, I will be working with a first order process that we're all used to. And uh, this will be in the frequency domain. And it will have the value of a gain divided by a first order denominator, which we'll call tau p s plus one. So the time constant of our process times s plus one. And so what we do first to figure out both AR and phase angle is we're going to let S equal J omega, where J is the uh, 
equivalent to the square root of minus one. So we're going to be working with um, imaginary numbers throughout this, uh, throughout frequency response analysis. And so um, what we do next is substitute that in. So we plug this in for s. We will get gp of j omega is equal to k divided by tau p times j omega plus one. And uh, the next step is we multiply by the complex conjugate. And so, um, as we'll recall, if we have some kind of complex number C, it will have the form A plus BJ. The complex conjugate I call C star will have the form A minus BJ. So we only invert the sign uh, or change the sign of the coefficient in front of the imaginary term. And so in that case, um, our coefficient here would be tau P times omega. So we're going to multiply uh, JP by uh, GP by minus tau P J omega plus one and we will multiply the uh, same in the numerator and uh, when we multiply all this stuff out what we will find uh, recalling the definition that uh, J squared is equivalent to minus one is uh, the following. We will have tau p squared times omega squared plus one divided by or over um, minus k times tau p times j omega plus k. And uh, what we find from this is that we can now break uh, jp I'm sorry, GP into um, its real and imaginary parts. And so this is a critical part um, of our FRA. And so um, when we do that, um, we'll recognize how the um, this part will be equivalent to the real part of GP. And uh, the other part will be the imaginary part without the J. So we will rewrite GP as K over tau p squared omega squared plus one uh, and then we will add it to the quantity minus k tau p omega over tau p squared omega squared plus one times j and uh, now we can see what the real part of g is as well as the imaginary part of G. And uh, now that we've done that, we can evaluate very quickly what our amplitude ratio and phase angle are. And so if we go back to what we know about uh, real and imaginary numbers, uh, we will see that uh, we'll have some kind of, uh, we can represent it on a Cartesian coordinate system like this. Um, and the magnitude of uh, our uh, complex number will have the form of the following. So using um, the triangle rule, uh, we can calculate what the hypotenuse is. Um, we can say that the magnitude of the complex number GP is equivalent to the square root of the real part of G, P, sorry, squared plus the imaginary part of G, P, quantity squared. Uh, and then we are going to take the square root of that. And uh, if you work through the math, uh, what you will find is that this is equivalent to K, P divided by square root tau p squared omega squared plus one. And uh, in addition to that, um, this is equivalent to your amplitude ratio. And uh, we'll get to what's cool about that in a minute. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we can calculate what our phase angle, I call it PA, which is equal to phi. 
uh, that is equal to the inverse tangent of the imaginary part of g over the real part of g. And um, so if we evaluate what that is, uh, we'll get the following uh, tan inverse of minus omega times tau p. And uh, so once we know the values for or the process time constants we're working with, uh, as well as what kind of uh, omega value we have, uh, we can tell someone what the phase angle is, so what kind of delay or offset they can expect to find. And so um, the key things to note here is uh, the physical intuition behind AR. And so with your amplitude ratio, what you'll note is the limit as we let um, omega approach infinity as the oscillations uh, of the uh, sine input increase in frequency, uh, what we'll find is that your amplitude ratio will uh, become zero. And so what this means is uh, the physical intuition behind this is if we had some kind of spring and a mass on the end of it, uh, if we uh, oscillated the spring up and down extremely quickly, um, what we see is that this mass, as you know how like the shock absorber works in your car, will stay relatively still. But if we move our spring up and down, our system up and down um, very slowly, we'll get very um, close tracking. So at very small omegas, um, we will have the highest um, amplitude ratios. And um, there are uh, resonant frequencies also that we can take into account that do make the dynamics of our system um, more interesting. Um, but in general, uh, what we'll find is as we increase our frequency, our amplitude ratio, um, we'll have some kind of trend like this. There'll be a negative trend and then a jump and it will continue to trend towards zero. And so um, at this particular uh, frequency, this is the resonant frequency, and uh, we'll get to that uh, later, but um, this concludes the introduction to frequency response analysis and the key concepts uh, to note. I hope you guys find it useful. Let me know if you have any questions, and thanks for watching.